All right, good morning. Oh, boy. I, maybe, maybe it was because my headphone was in, but I couldn't really hear that. So let's try it again. Good morning. Okay, we there heard that. There we are. You guys are there. That's amazing. I want to invite you to stand. We're going to sing. We're going to praise. We're going to lift up God. Amen? Amen.
much worship team for that reminder that God is so good. He gives us the privilege, the honor to call out his very name, to speak his name. Why? Because the finished work of Jesus Christ, that's what gives us the privilege and the honor to do so. And we need to shout as much, much as we can. Amen? Amen. So Yahweh, thank you, brother. I knew I could count on you, Dennis. Thank you, brother. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, God bless you. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, for those of you who came a little bit early, you got to witness a baptism. That was so cool today. We give God the praise and the glory for that. That was so awesome. It was a twofer. We had two people going in. Absolutely. It was fantastic. Absolutely wonderful. So praise the Lord for that. But just want to welcome you today. If today's your first day, just want to say thanks for being with us. And we're just so glad you're here. Uh, I want to keep you up to speed with what's going on. So grab your bulletins. I'm going to show you what's happening here. Just point you to a few things. You know, speaking of this understanding and the freedom and the ability that we get to speak the name of Yahweh, to be able to say the great I am out loud and, and, and to do so with endearment is a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Today we're in our series in Romans 8, and we're going to be looking specifically at how we have in Christ been fully adopted. So keep these notes close to you. We're going to be working our way through those uh, later uh, this morning. If you look at the green sheet there, it's uh, concerning uh, the diner here. This is calling all ladies uh, tomorrow from 1130 to 1. This is just a time of fellowship for any lady who wants to go and meet at Nana's during this time. If you're interested in being a part of that, the contact information is there at the bottom. So I encourage you, reach out and go and have a good time tomorrow with them. Uh, if you look at the pink sheet for spring cleaning, um, this is an opportunity that we're doing uh, next week on the 10th from from 5.30 to 7, um, we're going to be doing some cleaning outside in our shed. That sounds exciting, right? Like, you're just like, I can't wait. Um, yeah, we're doing it in the evening, so it's not so bad in terms of heat. But love, if you want to come out and help with organizing and getting stuff done, if that's your gift, if, if you have that kind of personality, we could definitely, definitely use you today uh, on that day. So I encourage you to, to come be a part of that. 
Uh, on the yellow sheet that has uh, the Diamondbacks, uh, this uh, actually is an invitation to a, to a game on September 13th. The cost will be somewhere between, you know, 20 to 56, depending on what you want to do. Again, Janet's the point of contact for that. Uh, she's here today. I encourage you to, uh, again, reach out to her if you're interested in, in thinking about that, okay? And, and the cool part about that is not only do you catch a game, but you also have a concert following it with uh, fireworks and testimony and all this. The band that's coming is called For King and Country. If you haven't heard them, they're absolutely phenomenal. So I want to encourage you, if you want to be a part of that, by all means, uh, contact Janet, okay? All right, that's what we have. Let's go ahead and pray. Let's ask God's blessing today as we celebrate together. Father, we love you. We thank you. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor. God, thank you that we have privilege today in you to be able to speak your name, to be able to proclaim with, with a loud shout and a loud voice, Yahweh, Yahweh. God, thank you that we can, can call out your most holy name. Thank you that there's no more holy of holies that separates us, that no, through your son Jesus, we now have access to you unlike any other. God, we give you praise for that. We ask that everything done within these walls would glorify your most holy name. And may it be about you from beginning to end. We love you. We thank you. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and stand. Greet each other today in the name of the Lord.
Okay, this time we'll go ahead and prepare for our morning giving. So again, uh, God is so good, and we acknowledge that all good things come from Him, that He is the Heavenly Father that just provides so many blessings. So as we give back to Him today, we do so not feeling forced or feeling compelled, but instead, as the Scriptures tell us, that we, when we give, we give cheerfully, because it's, we're saying, God, thank you for that which you've given us. So will you join me as we pray, as we lift up this time to Him? Father God, we love you. We're so grateful, so, so blessed, beyond measure. God, we want to acknowledge that all good and every wonderful thing comes from you. Father, thank you for provision. Thank you for blessing. Thank you for the way that you care for us in the small things and the big things in life. And God, may our eyes turn to you and may we say thank you today. As we give, Father, may you just put in our heart what's, what's right, what's what's what pleases you, what gives you joy. And I pray, God, as we do, may we just release that to you in a way that says, God, we trust you. We know you. We love you. And we're so grateful for how you take care of us. So, God, be honored, we pray. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. You are good. You are good. When there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, on display for all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace, when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, in you death has lost its sting. Oh, I run into your arms, I run into your arms.
together and pray. God, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for being here. God, I thank you for what you're about to teach us. And Lord God, as we, as we hear your word and as we hear what Pastor Monty has for us, Lord, let our hearts be turned towards you and let us truly hear you today. I give this time to you and ask that you would bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All God's people said amen to that. Hallelujah. God is good. Thank you. Thank you so much, team. Hallelujah. Well, as I was preparing for today, uh, especially in line of our subject we're going to be looking at today, I don't know, I just kind of had this weird thought. Isn't it just absolutely crazy how the older that you get, you start evaluating where and how far that you've come through in life? Anybody can relate with me on that? You know what I'm talking about? I don't know what it is. I just, you know, I don't know if time, I don't know, whatever it is, but it just seems like you get more evaluative the old, older you get. You know, having a daughter who just got married in January, of course, it kind of takes me back, if you will, back to the beginning of uh, the time with my wife and I. At 19, we were engaged, and 21, we were married, and uh, we were two young people that uh, wanted to unite, we wanted to make a marriage, we wanted to make a family, a home, a future, I mean, that was what we were thinking about in those moments, and and looking back all those years ago, and of course now, and then bringing it to now, it just blows me away, and it just humbles me too. You know, starting a new adventure called parenting, anybody can relate to that one, right? That's a whole other set of things when it happens. It came for me at age 25, and, and wow, I mean, what a life changer that that happened at 25. It wasn't just us anymore. It wasn't just my wife and I, and I anymore. In fact, uh, the trajectory of our lives changed, and, and there was greater responsibility and absolutely greater blessing that came as a result of it. I mean, you remember the first time everything? Remember that? Right? I'll never forget the first time that my daughter had an accident or what I call a blowout in her, in her diaper there. Um, <laughs> honey, I don't know what to do. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> that was my first time. But uh, again, first time everything. I just remember it being so amazing. And, I, and the thing that I remember most of those first times, I mean, what a moment. What a moment when I was called daddy for the first time. I mean, that I'll never forget. I'll never forget that. It was so heartwarming. It was so, I mean, mind-blowing. It was so world-changing as a result of my little girl saying that to me. I mean, I, of course, wanting the very best of life and purpose and future. My wife and I, what we did with every single one of our children we've had, we have a total of three, with every single of our children. When they would come home and the first night in the, into the nursery that we had prepared and the, and the crib that they had, we would lay our hands upon our children in that very first night and we would pray over them. And we said, God, we were offering them back to you. We acknowledge that you are the giver and sustainer of life, and we acknowledge that you've given us this incredible gift that we have in front of us. We prayed that each of our children one day would accept Christ as their Savior and Lord, that he would save their soul, and that he would always be the center within their life. Now, And we confessed, I'm not going to lie, in that moment we confessed to God, our need for his direction and for his help on how to raise them in a way that honors him. And that he alone, as the creator and sustainer of all life, again, is the very reason that we were given this precious little life to us. I mean, what a privilege. What a responsibility. Uh, what, what a blessing from God our Father to be able to do that. I mean, it's incredible. I, I, I often would ask myself, in view of that coming birth, and I don't know, maybe you can relate with me in this, but my question I remember as we anticipated the birth of our children was, can I love my child enough? Can I love my child enough? Anyone, can anyone relate to that in terms of those feelings and thoughts? I mean, to, to be married, to, to have children, to build a family, to belong with purpose, all of these things, this, I feel in my heart, I really feel that, that this is just but a very small glimpse in relationship with God the Father and, and as our Heavenly Father and, and, and a very present reality and joy with a promised future, eternal. What, what that truly is like, I feel 
that for those who trust in, in Christ through faith, it's just a small glimpse of what that kind of relationship is with God the Father. That God gives us a little, just a little peek here on earth of what that's like. Now, it was the Apostle Paul who was really trying to convey this understanding and teaching that was needed for the church in Rome. They, they needed some instruction regarding this understanding and, and to reveal ultimately what the goal was, what he wanted to do was to reveal to them, to kind of peel back the obstacles that get in the way of the vision of being able to see regarding just what God has done for them by His Spirit, and what He has provided for every individual who places their trust in faith in Christ. He wanted to, to kind of just peel back. How many times in Jesus' ministry would he, would he would say or He would declare at the end and conclusion of his, of his teachings, for those who have eyes to see, let them see. For those who have ears to hear, let them hear. See, Paul wanted them to receive this teaching, but we know, I know, you know, that there's many things, that many obstacles that get in the way at times of us being able to see truth, to see God, to see Him for who He is and what He's really done. And so Paul wanted to kind of peel that back. And so last week, what we looked at, in fact, in your notes, I've given you some of this. Uh, I'm not giving you every single fill in the blank. Uh, it's on you now to kind of take some notes as you feel led to do. But I've given you a few of these comments today that I'm sharing with you now. Last week we looked at Romans 8, no condemnation, in the fact that there is no condemnation for those in Christ, okay, that, that Jesus has fulfilled every bit of the requirements of the law that we could not ever fulfill on our own. But when we're talking condemnation, what are we saying? What we're saying here is that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That means that one day, every single human being, past, present, and future, is going to bow before God Almighty. They are going to acknowledge that He is Lord. They're going to, the scriptures are very clear in this. And, and the thing about it is, is there are many that say, well, you know, that the, maybe they don't believe in God or they, 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 they believe in something different or what have you. That's okay. You're welcome to do that. It doesn't change the facts. We're all going to stand before God. In fact, I could say that gravity doesn't exist either and to step off the roof and come to a very stark reality that regardless of whether or not I agree with it or even acknowledge it, it is still a reality nonetheless. So the truth is, is that we are all going to stand before God. Now, the beauty, the beauty is, is that when we stand before God, we're not, we don't have to do so in a position of fear or, 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 or of, of trepidation of going, God, uh, you know, being panicky in that moment. Why? Because if we're in Christ and Christ is in us, then what happens is Jesus says, hey, Father, this is one of mine. There's no fear in that, see? There's no fear. And what an incredible moment that's going to be, yes? And so praise God, there's no condemnation for those in Christ. There's no hell condemnation. That's what it's referring to. Why? Because Jesus fulfilled every single bit of the requirement of the law for, our, for us on our behalf, which we were incapable of doing. So today, what are we looking at? Today, we're looking at how he's going to continue that thought and springboard off of that teaching into understanding Romans 8 fully adopted. The big idea of today is this, that when, when we're born again through faith in Jesus Christ, we are adopted as sons and daughters. We, we become part of his family into God's family, which ultimately transforms our identities and our lives forever. When you come into the family of God, there's nothing better. There's nothing, nothing better. What sweet testimony we heard today by two young ladies that shared what God had done in their life. And their life will never, ever be the same from this point forward. And how, how, how cool is that? Part of something so much bigger. And, and when we understand this and when we apply this and we experience the reality when it takes root within our lives and our spirit, through God's spirit at work within you, then what happens is that the, well, we get this opportunity, see, to cooperate, and which really is our responsibility, each one of us in Christ, to cooperate with the leading of God's spirit as we change into the greater likeness of Christ. Okay, we need to cooperate. How many of you, be honest, how many of you fight God at times? How many of you do that? 
Okay, does it ever go well when you do that? That's the question of the day. It never does, right? I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I mean, growing up, I went through what's called the school of hard knocks. Anybody got a degree from that? Yeah, I mean, well, why do we do that? I don't know. It's kind of silly, but we do. We, we, we feel like sometimes we've got to go the opposite way just to discover the opposite way is not a good way to go. And, and the truth is, you know, we don't want to go the opposite way. God wants us to cooperate with Him and His Spirit within us because when He does and when we do, when we work in sync together, what's beautiful about it is that God brings a greater likeness of His Son into our lives. We start to reflect Jesus in greater ways, and, and we give Him praise ultimately for how we live. So transformation into Christ's likeness, it comes, it comes this way, though. It's not accidental. It comes by intentional choices, intentional choices that we make in concert with the Holy Spirit's guidance in our lives. In other words, that we, we determine that, that we're, we're going to yield His way as He leads and as He guides, okay? And so the goal for us, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tip my hand to you right now. I'm going to tell you exactly what I do. Okay, anybody here, uh, uh, perfectionists, great at sabotaging yourself? Okay, you know what I'm talking about where, you know, it's got to look a certain way, act a certain way, smell a certain way, be a certain way. Otherwise, if it's anything less than that, then somehow I fail as a human being and, and, I, and I'm completely worthless and devalued. And then what happens? We implode. We allow a lot of stupidity to happen and things start coming and boom, 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 boom. Everything just starts to go inward, right? Okay, here's the thing with this. When it comes to these intentional choices and working in, in, in this regard, uh, you know, not fighting, not fighting, but letting God Bring about this work in us. Here's, here's what I do. I used to be that way. I used to be a perfectionist. I used to sabotage myself. I used to say, well, you're a pastor for goodness sakes. You need to read the Bible every day, every single day, hour to two, every single day. You need to pray every single day. You need, and every single day. You can't miss at all. Okay? And then what would happen? Things would happen. Things would change. Things would come into play. I mean, wh one thing or another, next thing you know, I was feeling terrible. God laid this on my heart that I'm going to share with you right now. This is the goal that we should have, each of us. I want to encourage you with this. The goal that we should have for us should be this, that we will make more intentional decisions to follow Jesus Christ and His Spirit within and His guidance today than we did yesterday. You follow me? That today's goal is I want to be more intentional in following Jesus, keeping Him first today than I did yesterday. Because you're going to have bad days, yes? You're going to have deflating moments, yes? You're going to have setbacks, yes? You're going to have times when the flesh is going to creep up, yes? You don't stay down. You don't kick yourself. You don't keep, you know, whipping yourself. You say, God, thank you for the forgiveness. Thank you that I have. Why? Because I'm not condemned. You've already done the work. I'm already fully righteous in your eyes. In fact, so much so that the, the complete sinfulness of me, every part of what sent Jesus to the cross, all of my sinfulness is given to the Lord Jesus when I come to faith. And in return, in coming to faith, His full righteousness comes to me so that when God the Father sees me, He doesn't see me through what I do or what I don't do. And if you're here today and you think that being a Christian and following Jesus is about your performance, you're missing it. It's not about performance. You can't be good enough. You can't do good enough. You can't ever achieve anything on your own ability other than the Spirit of God in you, helping you, directing you, guiding you. Now, am I saying that we live like the world because we're, we're covered? No, it's not fire insurance. It's not. Okay, what it is, it's gratefulness and thankfulness for the grace and mercy of God. That it's not based on what I do or don't do. But it's all based on what He did at the cross. So when we experience this, it's to make more intentional decisions today than we did yesterday. So we must soberly assess our lives and yield more and more to the Holy Spirit's guidance. That's what we call spiritual maturity. You want to spiritually grow and mature in the Lord? Well, guess what? Yield more to His Spirit and less to your flesh. And we're going to talk about that today because Paul brings this up. Rather than allowing our choices to cater to the flesh that battles within, 
Okay, so let's turn with me in your Bibles, Romans chapter 8. We're going to look at specifically today at verses 12 through 14 right now. And we're going to talk about this battle that goes within. This battle within. Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 14. This is what the Word of God says. So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, that is to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons and daughters of God. Okay, so what is he saying here? So then, well, that's piggying off, if you will, off of what he just said in the first 11 verses in chapter 8. Again, ending with, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So in other words, the security that we can have, we can rest assured in, in our relationship, is in him and what he's done for us and in us. So then, brethren, brethren, we're under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, it's saying, for if, if you are living, that is, if you're guided by, if you're focused upon, according to, that is, that you're following its dictates. And, and, and how many of you, does, does, the, does the flesh tantrum and throw a tantrum? Does, does it ever get cranky? Is it kind of like that three-year-old in the store that's told no by the mom that you can't have the candy, and then they go off in line, right? Ever been there for one of those great moments? That's awesome, right? You're like, Yeah. Can I pick another line, please, right? No, it's crazy, right? But that's what our flesh does. It whines and cries and tantrums and, and, and wants all make all kinds of noise. It does in order to be noticed, okay? And it's saying here, if you live and are guided by and focused on by its dictates, according to the flesh, it says you're going to die. Is it saying physically? Well, we're going to look at that. We're going to look at that, but is it, is it a physical death or is there other ways that we die here now? But it says, but if by the Spirit, that is, if you're putting to death the deeds of the body, it says you will live. And there's a reason for that, and he wants them to see this. Ultimately, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons and daughters of God. So for all who are in Christ, for those who have a relationship with Him, for those who enter into it, not, not religiousness. Religion doesn't save you. It doesn't save you. Only a relationship with Jesus Christ does. And God has, what He has done is that He has fully forgiven us and our debt is paid in full, that he has placed his spirit within us. When we come to faith, it's not just us on our own trying to figure it out. It's the spirit of God actually physically, literally indwelling us. And, and, and his purpose is to, to, to guide us, to seal us, to, to correct us, to encourage us, to teach us, okay, to be the deposit of what is to come. That is the role of the Holy Spirit within us. And that we're no longer a slave to sin. We've been, through Christ, been set free fully. Those chains have been broken. And Paul wants them above all things to see this. Romans 8, 12, he says, so then, again, all those earlier verses, he says, brethren, he's speaking to those in the family of God, to those who are in Christ. He says, we, in Christ, we're under obligation. It's not to the flesh or the sinful nature or the old ways. How many of you at times feel as though that sinful nature is so loud that it drowns out at times the very voice of God. Do you ever wrestle sometimes in those moments? The question is, what are you listening to? Because I tell you what, God's always talking. God's always sharing. God's always reaching. And are you just, are you tuning out the frequency? It's just something to think about. It says, we're not under obligation to the flesh or sinful nature old ways, or not uh, also to live under the fleshly control. This has been broken through Christ and in Christ. Ultimately, this is where the battle ga- battleground begins. It's in, it's in our minds. In fact, uh, James 1, 14 to 16, I'll read it to you. Listen to where, how the battle takes place. It says, but each one, each one of us is tempted, that is, to fleshly drives and controls when he is drawn away by his, his or her own desires and enticed. Okay? What happens? Desire conceives, it gives birth to death. Oh, I'm sorry, it gives birth to sin, that is, flesh living. And when sin is full grown, it brings forth death. Don't be deceived, my beloved brethren. How many of you can can relate with me this morning how thoughts so quickly can run in the opposite direction of God? And how that we, we we can 
just let them kind of hang out. We let them kind of percolate, if you will, for just a little bit. And what ends up happening is that the longer that it sticks around, the more likely we are to give in. And, and, and the rea- reality is, is that we, we need to understand how this takes place. See, when we live, it says, don't be deceived, my beloved brethren. That is, flesh is, we're deceived that somehow flesh is, is living in and under Christ's control. That, you see, that's not true. The battle really is within. And to live under the flesh, making your decisions, what do I, what do I mean by that? What I'm saying, to live under the flesh means that you, you allow your desires to be tainted. Okay, the kind of desires that, that, that don't take you closer to God, but take you further from God. I'm talking about appetites, like the cravings that you start to get. You find out that the more crazy your thinking is and the more opposite is from the direction of where, of where God is, cravings start to pop up and things that you start wondering, how in the world did that actually become something I'm even, even remotely interested in in the, mo- in the moment? And that's when it starts to take root. And, and lusts, there's all kinds of lusts. There's lust of the flesh, that is sexual impurity and all kinds of things. But there's also material and power and knowledge. And, and think about it, what took place in the Garden of Eden, right? A lust was from Eve when she said that I, that fruit looked good for the knowledge that I could get from it. Okay, so again, lust ultimately is saying to God, I'm not content with what you've given or done in my life. And, and pride, oh my God, anybody here wrestle with pride? We have no idea about that, right? Yeah, I didn't think maybe three of us here in the room, I don't know, Okay. Yeah, here's the thing. Pride, pride, man, it creeps up so stinking quick. Man, it just, boom, like that can rise up and just rear its ugly head in so many ways. And, of course, selfishness. Oh, my gosh. That's, that is the epitome. That is the final fruit bearing of live, letting the flesh run amok. It's, it's complete selfishness. It's the epitome and the antithesis of self-control, which is the chief fruit, if you will, of the fruit of the Spirit. But selfishness. Why? Because really when we say, when we're living by the flesh, we're saying, what's best for me? Me becomes very important. And, and not only that, but what makes me happy? Or, or what makes me feel good? These are the things that we start elevating, start giving value to in terms of the, the equation of how we think about life and what it should be. And that's where flesh is going crazy. Okay, in those moments, regardless if those thoughts or decisions are very opposite of God and everything that God has word and his word has spoken against directly. See, the thing about the flesh, here's the truth. The thing about the flesh, it's not life giving. It's life taking. It sucks joy and peace and happiness and all those things. And I think in some ways that life taking, that's some of the death that he's talking about here. So what kind of death comes from from losing the battle within? Well, Constable, one of my commentators, says this. He says, Christians who follow the dictates of the flesh can look forward to death. Now, not not eternal death, because we know there's no condemnation, no separation. Okay? But there's temporal, temporal death that we can experience in the now and in the present. I've given you three of them in your notes. First of all, there's called separation of body from soul. Now, what am I saying here? I believe with all my heart, Scripture affirms and attests to it that, that there are times where if you choose to run amok and let flesh go crazy, that you can actually prematurely cause your life to be shortened here on earth, that God will save your soul by taking you out early because he loves you that much. He doesn't want you to, to ever you know, uh, uh, run away from him. But in this, some decisions that are made can cause that. What? Sex and drugs and booze, those are not exhaustive, but, but uh, many, many ways in which those fuel and, and come into that can lead to a very early and premature death. And, and God will cut your life short to save your soul if he so chooses. First John 5, 16, the very beginning of it says, kind of gives us an idea. And it says, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin, here it is, not leading to death, he shall ask God, ask, and God will for. Uh, For him, give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. This is not an easy concept to think about. Yet God in his mercy can choose to take someone home with him to save them. Now, Guzik, another commentator, says this. He says, this is a difficult concept, but we have an example of it in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 30. It's there where Paul says that among the Christians in Corinth, because of the disgraceful conduct of the Lord's Supper, it said some had died 
Many are weak and sick among you, he says, and many sleep. See, this death came not as a condemning judgment, but as a corrective judgment. When we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. So there are times when those can happen as well. There's also separation from others. Now, how many times has that happened? That decisions that you've made and, and the flesh uh, has been elevated and it's me, 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 me. How many times has that killed relationships and connections in your life? Think about that. Trust broken and shattered with those in your life. Disconnected from meaningful relationships through our own selfishness and narcissism ultimately put in a chokehold, choking out real connection in that. Why? Because flesh is first above all else. That happens socially. And also, all last but not least, there's also separation from self. Now, this can be psychological and alienation and disorders. Why? Because we allow in, in these flesh moments and thoughts that guilt and shame and blame and hurt and pain and trauma and drama and everything that goes with this, some through personal choices with repetitive unpleasant consequences, what happens is that the mind gets seared. The mind gets seared and becomes numb. And the sense of self and understanding and value and worth and purpose, all of those things plummet until God Almighty softens the heart and the mind to bring them back to that understanding. See, in all these scenarios, one constant is, is, is that personal thoughts and feelings are given the highest value and priority as a, man's, or as a means rather to guide self and choices made for life. See, what happens is we, we, we elevate our personal thinking, our personal feelings, that those creep up and those are factored in. And that's why the flesh plays into this so greatly. The truth is this, the flesh seeks only its own way. It does not run to God, it runs from God. And it's not a reliable or accurate or truth-bearing source to trust. I'm telling you, don't lean on your own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is one of the best Proverbs ever. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and you make your path straight. He'll help you with life and direction and purpose and focus. Why? Because you can't lean on just you. Which this understanding, Paul then focuses the conversation. He does. He, he makes a change to what the only true source to trust for guiding your life and to remove ways that we're separated. And that's in the end of 13 and 14. He says, but if by the Spirit. That is, if we're being led by the Spirit. You in Christ are putting to death the deeds. Uh, that is the flesh decisions. You're putting to death those flesh decisions of the body. It says you will live. You'll experience life. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons and the daughters of God. So to put to death, to put off, to rid yourself, all of these imply something to us today. That it involves action on our part. It's not accidental. It has to be intentional. You have to willfully want to say, God, I don't want to live that way anymore. I want to live for you. And I want to follow you, not what my flesh desires, and wants. To get rid of those flesh decisions and, and follow instead God's Spirit at work within, you have to seek to make Spirit-led decisions. Ones that won't take your life, but one that will give life, will give you hope, and will give you peace and freedom and joy and purpose. That's what God wants for you. How many of you, how many of you experienced that? When, man, you're living in the, in the flow, when you're, when you're right there and you're dialed into God and you're keeping your eyes on Him and, and, and you're, just, you're making great decisions in Him, leading you and guiding you. I mean, don't you feel reju rejuvenated, energized, and peace? And uh, Don't you feel that in your life? Those, that doesn't happen accidentally. That happens because you are in Him and Him in you, and you're, and you're looking to Him. You're following the one who's the author and perfecter of our faith. You're keeping your eyes on him where it needs to be. Constable says that those who put to death the misdeeds of the flesh will experience ab abundance of life. And, and, and the interesting piece in this is, is sometimes we think at times, well, well, here's this flesh item that keeps popping up, and, and if I just kill it once, then I don't ever have to do it again. No, the tense of these verbs, the tense of these verbs states continual action, meaning that it's hourly and daily. 
that we need to come to that place. Whenever it pops up. You ever remember that crazy uh, arcade game called Whack-A-Mole? You ever remember that? For some reason, I just had this strange image just pop in my head. For those of you who are young and have no idea what the heck an arcade is, thank you for making me old. Um, <laughs> there's a game where these little things would pop up and you literally have a mallet and you'd smack it down. I, I pictured this in my mind, those moments that flesh pops up, pops up, pops up in the spirit of God through his word and through his power. You say in Jesus' name, no, 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 no. You keep saying no, okay? And, and that's the truth. Continual action, daily hour, just taking care of that flesh. So to live according to the Spirit, how do we do that? Some said, well, okay, we talk all this church language and churchies. How does that even flush out into my life? How in the world am I going to apply this when I leave? To live, if you will, according to the Spirit is this and this way only. It's God first thinking. You understand? It's God first thinking, meaning He's where I start no matter what decision I face or situation. He's the one that I ask him in that moment to guide me through those decisions and situations throughout the day. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I need this reminder. I had my hat handed to me this week. This was a terrible week, terrible week for me. And I'm probably in line because this very message I'm giving you. So I'm telling you something. I'm telling you what I got to do, okay? I, I need to do this same exact thing. I needed this reminder because it's good. Because yes, why? Because I tell you what, I had my hat handed to me when I took my eyes off the Lord. When I just looked away just for a minute, I had my hat handed to me. And I tell you what, I hate that. I hate it. Okay? And the truth is, we need to keep Him first. The Spirit leads us objectively. How? Through the Scriptures. So that's the beautiful thing. Objectively, He leads us through that. And internally, subjectively, by His internal promptings. Now, how many of you have had that? How many times have you had those moments where you're facing something, it's a temptation, it's in front of you, and all of a sudden you get that little inner feeling saying, don't do it. How many have had that? Okay, in those moments, have you said, okay, okay and you follow? Or do you do like most, la, 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 I'm not listening? How many of you have done that? I'm not a freak, I promise. You look at me like I'm one, but... You know what I'm talking about. Where those internal promptings are there, and yet you ignored it. And you went through it, and you got on the end of it to go, I really shouldn't have done that. Yes? You've done that. Yes? See, see the truth is, uh, what I love, one of my favorite scriptures, don't always apply it, need to, that's what the reminder is, that's that God first thinking, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, no temptation has seized you except that which is common to man. That means there's nothing new under the sun. It might be a different time, space, and place, but I guarantee you it's the same old junk again and again and again and again. There's nothing new. No temptation has seized you except that which is common to man. And God is faithful. Hear this. He will never allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, I love this, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can stand up under it. Do you realize that God is always faithful in that. Painfully, painfully, I remember moments of temptation that I saw the out and I didn't take it. Only to come in the end. Uh, experience the wonderful fruit of flesh driven is what? Pain, pain, you know, drama, shame, blame, guilt, hurt, all that fun stuff that goes with it. Yeah, no fun, no fun. Absolutely. God has set us free in this. First, God first thinking has to happen. So objectively through the scriptures, subjectively by his internal promptings. First John 3.24 says, those who obey, that is those with intention, make the decision intentionally uh, to, to obey God's commandments. They remain in fellowship with him and he with them. And we know that he lives in us because the spirit he gave us lives in us. Now, what are we saying here? Do we lose fellowship? Do we lose our relationship with God? Am I, am I saved? Am I unsaved? Am I saved? Am I unsaved? I mean, is that how it rolls? Is that how it works? No, it's not that. Once you're justified, you're forever justified. God declares that. It's a, it's a declaration stamp over you. And it says that he's transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the sun and light. There's been a relocation where we are. So, no, can you lose your salvation? No, you can't. But I tell you, what you can do is you can, can hurt the fellowship between you and God. 
God's not the one who moves, by the way. You and I do. We turn our back. We stop looking at him. And then we wonder why life kind of falls apart. God wants us to see him face to face. Man, that's what he wants. That's the kind of intimacy he wants. That's the kind of opportunities that we have. And we have and we obey, we follow with intention. Oh, man, good things come. Good things come in that fellowship. The sweetness of it comes in that fellowship. So those in Christ, praise God that his view, his love isn't conditional, okay, upon our actions or our inactions, but on the completed work of Christ on our behalf. So in Paul's pointed contrast, what takes life, that is flesh decisions, and what gives life, that is spirit-led decisions, he reveals and leads the, and the readers to what makes our connection with Christ even greater, even sweeter, okay? Look with me, Romans eight fifteen to 16, as we kind of finish this up here. 15 to 16 says this, for you, he's speaking to those who are in the family of God, for you in Christ, you have not received the spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. I love the fact that 2 Timothy 1.7 says, for God's not given you a spirit of fear. If you're in this room now and you feel fear and you live by fear and fear controls you like crazy, I'm telling you what, that's not from God. That's not from God. You need to call that out for what it is. God's not giving you a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, love, and a sound mind. We're not and have not received the spirit of slavery that leads to fear again. No, no fear of the grave, no fear of death or of hopelessness to conquer. All sin and flesh is no longer in control. Absolutely, that is no longer something that runs us. Why? Because of Jesus and how he conquered sin and death upon that cross for those who through faith receive Jesus Christ. I mean, this spirit of adoption is amazing. Think about this. The fact that we, as, as Jeremy said, we, we can cry out the name of Yahweh. We can speak it out. The name that should never be mentioned without, because of the holiness of, of what's attached to it, that, that when you say Yahweh, you're saying the I am. It's the same one that, that was asked uh, Moses, so who do I say sends me? You tell him I am that I, I am has sent you. Yahweh, the, the very name of God himself. I mean, how precious it is that we get to, to have this kind of relationship to call out to him, to give honor to him. For those who through faith have accepted and received him, a spirit of adoption becomes our connection now with God the Father through Jesus Christ. And, and as sons and daughters of God, we're no longer estranged from him. But we've become part of the most amazing family with an incredible future, with the most amazing father that we could ever have. The fact that you can call God dad. Have you thought about that? And you might have had a terrible earthly example of what a father is. And I hope that God helps undo that in you. I can't imagine just how special that is that God has allowed us, that he, we can call the very King of kings and Lord of lords, Daddy. How amazing that is. I tell you what, I have something that just... I want to show you that just speaks to me so much of this incredible relationship that we're given and how God afforded it and, and how, how he loves you and I so much that he desires this incredible connection to call him dad, to go into the very presence of God Almighty himself. And to be able to have such a unique, special relationship. I, I want to show you a picture that, that was given to me. One that I think just signifies a lot what this moment is going to be like when we go to heaven. That words aren't going to be able to contain. And I want you to see this picture. And I want you to interact with what you're about to see. I just notice the look on the face. Do you see that? Do you see the incredible picture of, of what bliss is on that face? 
I can't wait to give God a hug. Can I get an amen to that? I'm going to beat you. I'm going to beat you there to him. I'm telling you right now. Seriously, how, how amazing is that? I love what that picture conveys, just the completeness of him being our father and how amazing that day is going to be when we see him face to face. Because we have this ability, we can call him dad or father or Abba. It gives privilege to all through, in Christ through faith. And, and what joy there is to know Christ and, and he to know you. And for you to be able to call him daddy. And, and, and there's nothing in that that's better. Nothing better. All the more reason for our amazing future, our amazing family, and our most amazing father, that is our daddy that we have one day that we're going to see. And to encourage us. That should encourage us to cooperate. Cooperate with leading of God's Spirit as we, as we change into greater likeness of Christ. And, and as we cooperate, it's, it's, it's by the Spirit with His leading that we're able to be victorious over sin and flesh. And Constable says the Spirit doesn't enslave us, okay? He doesn't compel us or force us to do God's will as slaves of God. No, He appears to us and appeals to us, rather, to submit voluntarily as sons and daughters. And what that means, in essence, is that God does not grab you by the head and starts dictating where you're going to go. He wants you, as sons and daughters of His, to say, Father, here I am. To follow Him, here, here I am. Willingly, voluntarily, willfully. So as we wrap this up here, here's the deal. What a glorious provision that we have through God, our Father being our dad. And that flesh no longer has to have control. You can put it to death. And, and the Spirit of God within us can transform us uh, and help us to conquer sin and flesh within us, giving us, if you will, an amazing future, an amazing family, and obviously the most amazing Father who loves us immensely. For all, for all who come to Christ through faith, fully forgiven, fully adopted, by Christ. Now I wonder, and, and I just this is my thought. I wonder if the wow and the amazement of being called daddy is what God feels with every Christ follower adopted by him. I wonder if he feels that. I wonder if that warms his heart. So, church, today may the Spirit of God may it dwell in you richly. May you be in full cooperation with all that God wants to do in His transforming work within you. And that all that He's doing in you to reflect Christ in every single way. That you might bear His likeness in full. And may we give God the full praise for it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank You for today in Your Word and life. And God, the fact that we have the privilege and the honor to call you dad. Father, thank you for doing what you've done on our behalf. God, we pray that today, as those in Christ, that God, as we are adopted into your family, Father, we want to say thank you, and we ask, Lord, that you would help us to, to put to death everything that stands as an obstacle in keeping us from loving you in greater ways. Don't allow the flesh to creep up on us, Father. Help us through you to be victorious. Father, for those in the room that may not have that relationship with you yet, have not asked you to be their Savior, I, got, I just encourage that you would move in such a way that, that they would see and understand that you are waiting and longing and desiring for them to come into relationship with you. So God, turn their heart and affection to you. And may we give you the praise for it in advance. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time we're going to go ahead and prepare for... Our time at sharing the Lord's Supper, and I've asked Mike to come and share some words with us today. If you want to look just briefly into the book of Luke and uh, his rendition of the uh, Lord's Supper, there is a place in chapter 22 and verse 14, and it says, When the hour had come, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never, 
again eat it until it has been fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And having taken the cup, what he had given, uh, when he had given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And having taken some bread when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after he had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of one portraying me is with me on the table. I was thinking earlier um, in preparation for this about how things don't always go the way that you think they should. Uh, you make plans. You're going to drive someplace, the car won't start. You're going to uh, work at your house and, and something doesn't work. Or... You set something on the side on the counter and it falls off or whatever. And, and some of you that uh, um, I know, Megan, you probably let things go when they fall on the floor right now, don't you? Since she's about nine months pregnant and things like that. We, we, we tend to just uh, uh, have those things happen because we cannot plan for, the, for, for perfection. We cannot do perfect. And I'm impressed with one of the things that we see in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was never, he was never surprised. He was never taken off guard. He never was uh, suddenly uh, uh, overwhelmed by anything. He was always saying the right words at the right time in the right way. And when he comes to this time here, he's been telling the disciples over and over again, I'm going to die. Uh, somebody's going to um, betray me. I'm going to the cross. I'm going to rise again from the dead. But yet, even after, that time, even though Jesus is saying that, and even though he says this in the Lord's Supper and tells them this is, uh, this is the blood of the new covenant, this is my blood being poured out for you that you're remembering, this is my body broken for you, his disciples still didn't get it because if you look just a little further in the passage, beginning in verse 24, they start discussing who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. They still didn't get it. And so when Jesus is betrayed, all of a sudden, even though he's been telling them over and over again, it probably would have been a lot worse, of course, if he hadn't told them ahead of time, they fall apart. They run. Um, they hide. They don't, they don't understand what's happening. And, they, and they're devastated. And, and Jesus has been killed. And they don't, any, they don't have any... Um, uh, they they kind of lose hope. But nothing that he had said was going to happen didn't happen. And everything that he said... Uh, was going to, did, and they should have been able to look back and see that that, was, that is what was going on. So as he comes to this, even in verse 21, where it says, Behold, the hand of one who is betraying me is with me on the table. He knew about Judas ahead of time. He knew that was going to happen. It was all part of the plan. And the difficulties that you have during the work week, uh, the the, the uh, troubles that you encounter, the people that you interact with that don't go well, God already knows about all those things. And those sin temptations that Monty talked about this morning that are coming across your path, God knows about those as well. But he's asked us to prepare as we come to the table and we think about what he's done for us to prepare our hearts, to take just a few moments to look into ourselves and say, is there something I need to confess? We had a lady in one of our former churches that uh, I, I noticed as I served communion uh, every month that she was never taking it. And I finally confronted her about it and say, how come you, you don't take communion? And she said, I don't feel worthy. I said, you're missing the point. The point is that this is to come to confession and then you are you are worthy. You're already declared worthy. But then in your relationship with God, you kind of, this is a place to, to refocus it again. And so this morning, this is your opportunity. This is the time for you to think for just a moment, to introspect and say, okay, now, is this, is there something in the way in my relationship between me and God? Am, am I, uh, you know, Monty, Monty pictures that uh, seeing Jesus and wanting to rush up into his arms and so forth. And, and some of us, uh, we're, we're, we're thinking, wow, when I get there, I don't know. I'm going to maybe kind of try and hide for a while. It doesn't have to be that way. Uh, you are forgiven, but you also have the relationship that can be restored. Um, the 
walk with him. So as we come to this time now, let's take a moment to share in our own hearts. Talk to God. Confess our sins, knowing that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Lord God, as we commit this, uh, these elements to you right now, and we thank you, Lord, for speaking to us through them and reminding us and giving us this remembrance, we pray that you would give us your grace as we share them. And Lord, may we, uh, may we accept the forgiveness that you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I've asked a couple of men to come and join us here in the front, and we will pass the elements at this time. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. church we need your power in us and we seek your kingdom first we hunger and we thirst we refuse to waste our lives for you are our joy and prize to see the captive hearts release the hurt the sick the poor
Yes, there it is. <laughs> okay. On the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. He passed it to his disciples. Among his disciples, they broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. Eat in remembrance of me. He also passed the common cup, part of the ceremony of the Passover as well, and said to them, there's a new covenant. The old covenant is going away. The new covenant is made in my blood. Let's drink this remembrance of that. So we're going to celebrate, amen? This is a time of remembrance, a time to remember what Jesus did, the seriousness of, of everything he did, but a time to celebrate together that we live under that. Amen? Let's, let's all stand together. Let's sing.